great to hear from Pastor Mike. Well, when does he come home? Flies Wednesday? So he flies Wednesday. So I know you have been praying diligently for him, and the team continue to do so uh, as they fly home and uh, pray for the family as well as they can't wait for dad and husband to return. I, um, I don't, we don't normally do this. It's more of a, I guess, a more woke thing. I don't know what woke is, but uh, they, they say you're supposed to give a trigger warning if you're going to show something that might do a flashback to someone or to, or to young children uh, watching something. So I'm going to show a video here. So trigger warning, if you're a young one here, if you're a parent with a young one here, it, it's, it's acting, it's not real, but it is something, um, it's a little violent. So if we could just, just watch this. I don't know how that got in there. Did you do that, Sherry? That's our granddaughter, Faith. She turned two. Yeah, oh, yeah, I did that. We, we did that. Well, not really, but uh, I watch that video every day. It just makes me giggle. I go, that is a picture of God as love, you know, just the innocence. And, uh, man, she looks just like me, so beautiful. <laughs> that was not supposed to be funny. For real, though, there, this is a video, and there's a bit of a trigger warning uh, for this one. So if you have a young one here, there's a little violence. It's not, not gory, but go ahead and play the video. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look. He said, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. <coughs> Dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. <sighs> Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed. Oh. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees. Oh. And cried out. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was there giving approval of his death. Acts chapter 7, the, the disciple Stephen has portrayed in this video. He was railing against the Jewish courts, the Sanhedrin. And, and when he confronted them, in, confronted them in their sin, he suddenly found himself in, in danger. What we just watched is recorded in Acts chapter 7, and I'm going to read a few verses, 57 to 60. They cried out, they being the Sanhedrin, they cried out with a loud voice. They put their hands over their ears, and they all pushed on Stephen. Then they took Stephen out of the city, and they threw stones at him. The men who were throwing stones laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. Yes, the Saul who would receive Jesus later in his life and become the apostle Paul. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. And while they threw stones at Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And after he fell on his knees, with his hands lifted high, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he died. So facing death, Stephen didn't cry out for revenge. He, he didn't demand an apology for the stone throwers. He forgave them. Facing death, Stephen 
understood that this was about him and God. It was something that his master, Jesus, modeled in his own death. So each one of us, in our own way, we're facing death. Some sooner than others, but we're all facing death. Our life is going to end one day. And all of this is about God. All of this is about you. This is about your relationship with God. It doesn't matter what kind of stones are being thrown at you. Our response ought to be the same each and every time. Forgiveness. It's not easy, but it's necessary. So it's been seven days since I preached the sermon on forgiveness. Who did you need to forgive? Let me ask, who did you forgive this week? Or maybe I should ask as well, who do you still need to forgive? Let me pray. Father God, you, um, you did a powerful work through the Holy Spirit last week, and, and I believe during this whole week leading up to today. I, I don't know what kind of work you were doing, but I know you were at work on each one of us. I know the enemy was also at work trying to disrupt the message that you delivered, trying to disrupt the, the, the leading of the Spirit in each one of us. And so to, again today, I pray against the evil one who's trying to distract us from what you have for us. But I'm thankful, Lord, for our response from last week. I'm thanking you for our response for this week. Because, Lord, I truly believe that if our hearts are open wide and if we trust you, you, you've never failed us. It may feel that way, it may look that way, but, Lord, you have never, ever failed us. You are love. And you call us to forgive, even though it's not easy. And you call us to reconciliation. So, Lord, thank you for what you're about to do again. In your name I do pray. Amen. So if you're joining us this morning and you weren't able to get out last week or to hear last week's sermon on forgiveness, can I encourage you to watch it on, online? Because we're going to move into the next topic today, which is reconciliation. And these sermons, they do go hand in hand. And I, I want to continue this morning with my illustration. So if you missed last week, I told a long illustration, and I said I was going to weave it between this sermon and, and next week's, or this week's. And it's about my friend and my relationship with my friend, who I'm, who I'm calling David. Wink, wink. Yes, he knows I'm talking about him, by the way, just so you all know. Um, so I ended last week's portion of the illustration with me forgiving my friend David. And when I forgave my friend David, a huge weight literally lifted off my shoulders. The burden that I had been carrying was all now gone. A sense of relief, a, a wave of release it came over me. And when I uttered those words to God, I forgive David, I was at peace for the first time in a long time. Now, did I still remember the hurt? Of course I did. We talked about that last week. We don't forget. Did I, still, did I still feel the pain? Yes. But I suddenly no longer wanted revenge. I no longer wanted to inflict pain. Nor did I want to try and balance those scales of justice. I was okay. I was okay. I was okay. Because my relationship with God had been repaired. What once was splintered by my unforgiveness became whole again. 
And so I cried literally. There were tears of joy, tears of relief over this reconnection with my God. Because forgiveness, remember, it's, it's up and down. It's between God and me. It's about my relationship with God. But I also, I also cried tears of sorrow. Because despite my forgiving my friend David, I still didn't want a relationship with him. He had gone too far in what he had said and did. Something that was ugly, something that was ungodly had sprung out of his innermost being and, he, and it reared its head in such a way that without change, I did not want him in my life ever again. 22 years of friendship destroyed. I had forgiven David, but we were not restored. Our friendship was not restored. Now the evidence of my genuine forgiveness, the evidence of your genuine forgiveness, is personal freedom from a vindictive or vengeful response. Romans 12 says this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. So you know you have truly forgiven the person when you no longer seek revenge or retaliation or have the desire to balance the scales of justice. You can still remember the pain. You can still feel the pain. But you no longer have that sense of, I gotta get even. Let me tell you this right now, from experience, firsthand. If you've tried to forgive someone and you still have these thoughts, you haven't really truly forgiven them. You gotta try again. Well, what do you mean try again? What do I gotta do, pastor? You gotta pray. You gotta pray good things onto that person. Ask God to bless them. Ask God to help them. Ask God to help you and keep praying and then forgive and forgive. This is about you and God and your relationship with God. And when you get to that point of being okay, of no longer demanding justice, then you know forgiveness has truly occurred in your heart. And let me tell you from firsthand experience, that's a beautiful place to be. It's, it's peaceful. It's calming. It's what God intended for us. Don't be misled. Forgiveness is not restoring relationship. Forgiveness is between you and God. Restoring a relationship, though, is between you the person, and God. Reconciliation, unlike forgiveness, can't be done on your own. You need God. You also need the other party, the other person. So there is a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness is always required by God, but it doesn't always lead to reconciliation. Forgiveness is a vertical connection between you and God. It's, it's about our relationship with God. Reconciliation is a horizontal relationship. It's between you, the other person, and God has to be in the middle for it all to work. Forgiveness is a free gift. Reconciliation is a gift that sometimes comes with obligations. Reconciliation is the removal of hostility and the restoration of fellowship between two parties. Now, Jesus warned us that God would not forgive us our sins if we did not forgive those who sinned against us. We talked about that last week. It's not that we earn God's forgiveness by forgiving. Instead, God expects forgiven people to forgive. Yet forgiveness is very different from reconciliation. It is possible to forgive someone 
without offering immediate reconciliation. But reconciliation is focused on restoring broken relationships. And where trust is deeply broken, restoration becomes a process. Sometimes it's a lengthy process. Peter, I'm going to have to cough here for a second. If you're on mute. I'm good. I'm here to tell you, if you have forgiven the stone thrower in your life, I just want to say well done. Well done. Because I know it's not easy. But it's necessary. Because that's what forgiven people do. That's what God expects from his followers. However, I'm also here to tell you, it's okay if you haven't reconciled with your stone thrower yet. It's okay. It's okay. I, I don't know your situations. I don't know the names of the stones that have been thrown at you. Infidelity, abuse, incest, anger, gossip, theft, lies, bullying. I don't know what they are. You do, and God certainly does. And I won't, I won't be the person to tell you that once you have forgiven the offender, you must quickly be reconciled to the stone thrower. I mean, I know how difficult it is to forgive someone who has deeply hurt you, and I know how daunting it feels to seek reconciliation with the very one who hurt you. Reconciliation is a daunting task that God invites us into. Matthew 5, 9, blessed, says Jesus, are the peacemakers, for they are the sons or the children of God. 2 Corinthians 5.18, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and he gives us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, a few weeks passed after I forgave my friend David and I struggled about whether or not I should reach out to him. What if I make the first step towards reconciliation only to get rebuffed? What, what if I tell him it's all, under, it's all water under the bridge, but then he hurts me again? What if too much time has passed and this friendship is truly dead? Maybe I should just leave it at forgiveness. Trying to restore their friendship seemed like a daunting task. Because 12 years had gone by. So differing from forgiveness, reconciliation is based on the attitude and the actions of the offender. Let me say that again. Reconciliation is based on the attitude and actions of the offender, of the stone thrower. It's suddenly not just about me and God, it's about us and them with God at the center. There can be no reconciliation without both parties wanting it. That's the first step of reconciliation, my friends, is the desire to be reconciled. Both the forgiver and the stone thrower if the offending party has no desire to be reconciled, well, there isn't much you can do about it. You, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. All you farmers know that. This is where Romans 12, 18 comes into play, if you know this verse. It says, if it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, it's not possible if the other party has no interest in reconciliation. But if it's possible, as far as it's on you, you must live at peace with everyone. 
And if you aren't ready to be reconciled, if you, the one who's been offended, if you are the one who's received the stones being thrown your way, if you aren't ready to be reconciled, here's my advice. Don't force yourself because it'll likely mean your heart isn't really into it. So I want you to pray. I want you to wait on God. And God will show you what to do. Because that's what I did. I just stopped and I waited. Because I didn't know if my heart was really in to reconciling with Dave. And so I waited and I prayed. And then God showed me what to do. I, I don't know how many of you here know this, but I'm in the midst of a, of a, of a cancer diagnosis. Um, but in the midst of all of this, I had a heart attack not too long ago. Eh, it's okay. It wasn't a big one. Just a little one. My wife's not laughing. Her arms are going to be crossed here shortly. Um, <laughs> It wasn't a big one, but it was a reminder. It was enough of a reminder that my time on earth is likely shorter than I would like it to be. So as I prayed about many things, including my broken relationship with Dave, God spoke to me. It wasn't audible. I didn't hear a voice. He didn't write magically on the wall. But, but I just knew he was speaking to me. Can't explain it. I'm sure you've all experienced it at one point in your life. And God just said, be ready. Be ready. He was up to something. Then as I did my devotions, he led me to a verse. He read me to Romans 12, 18. Live at peace with everyone. And so I waited in anticipation of something happening. Something happened. I got a text out of the blue from my friend David. This was the first contact between us in 22 years. I was going to bring my phone up and read you the text because I've saved all the texts, but I thought, ah, it's pretty informal, so I'll just write it down. But this is word for word the text we sent back and forth to each other. So the first contact in 12, in 12 years, he wrote, Frank, I'm not doing good. It's my heart. How are you? I was dumbfounded. I was in shock. I, I'm not sure why I was so shocked because God had literally just told me to wait and he was going to do something. And he always follows through. But I didn't know what to do. I was kind of frozen. Was I ready to engage with him and risk getting hurt again? Through reconciliation, its chief, its, its chief aim is the restoration of broken relationships. It's a process, like I said. While it can happen quickly, and sometimes does, often it takes time, and a lot of it, for both the stone thrower and the target to heal. So while the first step in reconciliation is the desire to be reconciled, the second step of reconciliation is an admittance and an apology for the offense. Reconciliation is not a free gift. It comes with a price. Forgiveness, now well, that's free. Reconciliation comes with a price. To be reconciled with God, the price was the death of Jesus. So it makes sense that for us, reconciliation with another person comes with a price. The offending party must recognize their error and then they must ask for forgiveness. There's no reconciliation without forgiveness, which is why it's so important for believers to be quick to forgive, not for the sake of the person, but for the sake of their relationship with God. We cannot be reconciled with God without asking for and giving of forgiveness. There is no forgiveness of sins without a reconciled relationship with God. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 says this, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. There's more. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. So in this same way, there is no reconciliation with our brothers and sisters without first forgiving, and second, they're asking for forgiveness. Matthew 18, 15, 17. Moreover, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell them their fault between you and you alone. If he hears you, you have gained back your brother. In many cases, even if the offender confessed their wrong to the one they hurt and appealed for forgiveness, the offended party that could justifiably say, I forgive you, but it might take some time for me to regain trust and restore our relationship. Because it's a process. Things just don't go bang, 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 bang. Not all the time. So maybe today, maybe today you're here and you are a stone thrower. You know you have hurt someone. Doesn't matter what you did, how long ago you did it, or what your intentions were in doing it. You threw stones, and it hurt someone. Maybe you have even apologized for doing so. Well, I think there's something you need to hear. Because even when God forgives our sins, he doesn't promise to remove all the consequences from our sins. Yes, being forgiven, being restored, and being trusted is an amazing experience, but it's important for those who have hurt other people to understand that their attitude and actions will affect the process of rebuilding trust. Words alone are often not enough to restore trust. When someone has been significantly hurt and feels hesitant about restoration with their offender, it's both right and wise to look for change in the offender before allowing reconciliation to begin. So if you have thrown stones and you've apologized, I I'm going to be really blunt. You do not have a right for reconciliation without change in your life. You've got to rebuild that trust. And it's a process, and it might take time. could happen very quickly. But you've got to give the person you've hurt time to see change in your life, to know that they could trust you again. Well, I decided to answer my friend David's text. This is what I wrote. Sorry to hear about your heart. Is it serious? I, I literally, folks, I was shaking when I wrote the text. Have I started down a road I didn't really want to go down. One that I wasn't ready to travel on yet. Immediately I received a response. He wrote, yes, they aren't sure exactly what's wrong, but it's not good. Thanks for responding. It, it means a lot. So I wrote back, I will be praying for you and your wife. Then I wrote, you probably heard, I have cancer. He wrote back, what? No, I didn't. Treatable? My response they say no, Fonts. Listen, Frank, I want to apologize. I realize that my words once again destroyed a relationship. I have missed you in my life. I don't know if you will ever want to reconnect, but know that I'm deeply sorry. I will be praying for you too. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So when there is first a desire and second an admittance of guilt, the third step in reconciliation is restitution. This is kind of the hard one, I think. The stone thrower may be required to do something. It could be as simple as don't throw the stone again. It could be that simple. It may be the need to go for counseling or undergoing treatment. Or maybe it's just giving time and space to the other party that you have hurt. Something 
will be required. And when it does stone throwers, you need to be okay with it. And you need to follow through with it. And continue to be in prayer and make sure your relationship with God is secure. You know, when Jesus went to Jericho, he came across a, a rich tax collector named Zacchaeus. He was rich because he was a thief. Here's what scripture says, Luke chapter 19. When Jesus came to the place, Jericho, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down for today. I'm gonna stay at your house. And then when the people saw this, they all began to complain saying, he's going to, a, and to be a guest of a man who's a sinner. But Zacchaeus stopped and said to Lord, Lord, behold, half my possessions I'm going to give to the poor. And if I have extorted anyone, I'm going to give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to his house because he too is now a son of Abraham. See, Zacchaeus had broken his relationship with his God by being a thief. He wanted to be restored. And so he knew he had to make restitution. So he decided to give half his possession to the poor, and he gave four times back to the people he stole from. In this same way, stone throwers must make amends to the one that they've hurt. They've got to make amends. So after a few more texts back and forth, I promised to reach out to David the next time we were in his city. And that day finally came with much prayer, much forethought, I arranged to meet Dave for lunch in the mall food court. It was awkward. Man, was it awkward. We said hello. I asked about his health problems. He asked about mine. We compared heart stories, heart, heart attack stories. And then he apologized again. I told him I forgave him. He wanted to try and he wanted to explain himself but I told him it wasn't necessary. But I did ask, I did ask, Dave, did you really mean what you said? I asked him if he still felt that way when he said it. He sighed, and this is what he said. Frank, I said what I said out of fear and ignorance. I'm ashamed. I've gone to Scripture I prayed with godly men, I sought the advice of my wife, and I prayed to God. I am embarrassed that I thought those things, let alone said them out loud. That's not me, or at least it isn't me anymore. I can't believe I destroyed our friendship because I was afraid of something I couldn't even see and I didn't understand. Then it was my turn to apologize. Apologize for my unforgiveness, my bitterness, my desire for revenge, my short temper, my unloving re reactions to someone who was in pain and fear. I told him I was embarrassed. I was ashamed that it took me this long to get to this point. I asked him to forgive me. He laughed, he said, Frank, there's nothing to forgive. It was all on me. I disagreed. We laughed. Silence. And you got to know my friend. He's got a wicked sense of humor. He said, well, what do we do now, pastor? Can we start over? Can we start over? Reconciliation cannot and will not occur if any of these three steps have been missed or avoided. If the offending party is able to fulfill all three steps and you still do not want to be reconciled, hear this clear. Then the offense falls upon you as someone who is unwilling to be reconciled. I am not the arbiter of this. Your family is not the arbiter of this. Your friends are not the arbiter of this. 
God is the final arbiter. He knows the innermost parts of your being. He knows your true pain. He knows your anguish, and he knows your motives. He will be the one to judge the purity of your convictions. So this statement ought to bring you both great relief, because it's God who's in charge, but also a little bit of great fear, because God is not to be trifled with. He knows, and you cannot fool God. Many have tried, and all have failed. If the offending party is going through all three steps and is sincere about all three steps and you still do not want to be reconciled, Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, now it's on you, live at peace with everyone. So David and I started over. We hugged it out as bros do. Actually, if you ask our wives, we picked up right where we left off, minus the argument part. Only we agreed, as friends, to put up a few fences, put a few boundaries in place to keep us safe for the health and safety of us both. <laughs> Excuse me. Things that we wouldn't talk about. Or when we got into areas where it was pushing each other's buttons, we would give each other permission to simply say, hey, you know what, let's change the subject and then that we'd be okay with it. Those are the boundaries. Those are the changes that we had to make to our friendship in order to continue with a reconciled relationship. You will have similar fences and boundaries that you may have to put up in order to, to be reconciled to one another. Reconciliation is the embodiment of God's hope for a fractured world. God created us to be in right relationship with him with people, with creation, and with ourselves. Our happiness and fulfillment is determined by the quality of our relationships. And the Bible highlights reconciliation as the harmonious restoration of a relationship with God that provides the means by which barriers between people can be overcome. It can be overcome because God will not fail. I've missed my friend. I'm delighted to have him back in our lives. And the concept of reconciliation casts a vision for what can be, that when right relationships are restored. But the work of reconcilers is required for this to be accomplished. You must first be willing to be reconciled. There must be an admittance of guilt, and then there must be restitution. All of these steps, of course, are wrapped in the sweet embrace of forgiveness. So, are you ready to be reconciled? If so, when will you start?